So again, if I use Schrodinger equation, just like I used it before, what do I get now? I get h1 h bar squared, k1 squared over 2m equals h bar omega. That's the first when, we, when, when I substitute the solution in the Schrodinger equation for u equals 0, u equals 0 is the left-hand side. This is what I get. The energy, all kinetic, energy of the particles is all kinetic, okay? And this energy, E, which is this right-hand side, h bar omega, is equal to h bar squared k1 squared over 2f. When I apply Schrodinger equation to the left-hand side, the right-hand side, which is the region where I have potential u naught, and remember, u naught is larger than E, so I have a region of higher potential than the energy of the electrons. Remember, E is the same as here. So what you have here is h bar is squared, k2 is squared, or is equal to 2m is square root e minus u naught. This is, let me see. This is actually h h bar k. So, so this is what I have here over 2m inside the square root. Everything is inside the square root. So that's what I get for h bar k2. Okay? Or if you like, what you could do also is you could write your k2 as 1 over h bar, okay, like this. Now, but u naught is larger than u, larger than e. So this quantity here is negative. And it's negative inside the square root. So that gives me i over h bar. And then what I have is u naught minus e over 2m. So that negative, because e is less than u naught, what I get is I get I. So K2 has, it's an imaginary number. The wave number is an imaginary number. So going back, okay, to this here, K2 is an imaginary number. So I can write it as I times some real number alpha. So my if psi x larger than zero would now become a t and then e minus alpha x because i times i is minus one and then I get E minus, uh, minus I omega T. So, this function is now very significantly changed. I don't have a harmonic function in position X. I have a real function here, which is an amplitude that decays with position. And the only harmonic part is in time. So it's a decaying wave function with a decaying amplitude, which is this one here. 
This is the same thing that I have written. So the transmitted wave is a decaying wave with a decaying amplitude. All of this is a decaying, exponentially decaying amplitude, and it's harmonic in omega. So if I want to draw this, this is the incident wave, okay, which is blue. Then I have substantially big reflected wave. Okay. Then you add the two waves, you get this wave on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, you don't get a wave in position because this is x. I don't have a wave. I have an exponentially decaying function, okay, which is this function. And it decays very quickly to zero. But in this region, still I have some penetration, some amplitude. So, some of the particles have gone through the barrier, and then they die out inside the barrier. And then, it, it becomes zero after a very short distance inside the barrier. So, there is some particle that make it through the barrier. Now, let me take a, a, an interesting scenario now. If I make this barrier very thin, so, this distance is very thin, thin meaning angstroms, few angstroms, 10, 15 angstroms, where I have this large barrier, but then after this 15 or 20 angstroms, the potential becomes zero. So, the picture here becomes the same as the picture here. The only difference is inside this barrier. So, what happened is, again, you have incident and reflected wave here, a decaying wave here, but if this barrier is thin enough, very thin, okay, then on this particle that make it outside here, continue again as waves. So, essentially, I have particles incident here, particles emerging or getting out here, particles dying out inside the barrier. So, the net effect is you still see some particles on this side of the barrier, even though the barrier has higher energy or higher in energy than the energy of the particles. This effect is very important in electronics. It's extremely important in electronics. It's called tunneling effect. Tunneling meaning that even particles that have less energy than a barrier, and if this barrier is very thin, some of the particles can make it through the barrier to the other side. Now, classically, this is unacceptable. But as we can see here, quantum mechanically, it's acceptable. And this acceptable effect in quantum mechanics is called tunneling. And you probably heard about the tunnel diode. The tunnel diode, actually, it's an electrical device which works on this principle. It works on the principle that energy, electrons of less energy than a barrier in a structure can still make it through the barrier. Some of them can make it through the barrier by tunneling and conduct a current. Let me give you an example of how you actually make this kind of barrier in a lab. Imagine that you have a metal okay, sheet here. Okay? And then imagine that on top of this metal, we grow an insulator. Okay, so this insulator may be silicon dioxide. Okay, so silicon dioxide is an excellent insulator. Okay, silicon oxide, which is an insulator. And then on top of the silicon oxide, we have another metal. Okay, so this is another metal here.
Okay, so let's make some connections, electrical connections here, here, and this is like a capacitor, right? And then let's put a voltage across, right? Silicon dioxide is an insulator, so we shouldn't get any electrons. You know, we have so many electrons here, and elect, and we have so many electrons here, okay, in the metal, and the electrons in the metal are trying to cross through this insulator and go to the other metal, and then give me a current if I have an ammeter here. But that doesn't happen because we have an insulator. However, if we have a very, very sensitive ammeter, and if this silicon dioxide is, which is the barrier, the energy barrier, is so thin, so if this is 10 angstroms, okay, then we will see a current here, meaning some of these electrons that are waves decay inside here, but then some other smaller number emerges. Remember, this is an effect we call leakage in a capacitor. We get a current even though we have an oxide, an insulator. That's the case only if this insulator is very thin, so that you don't get all the particles, or electrons in this case, dying out. You have to have it thin enough so that they die out, but as we get to the edge of the insulator, some of them make it out. And that gives you the very little current that you register here. This effect is called the tunneling effect. Let's look at an example. A beam of electrons having a kinetic energy of 2 electron volts. So that's the total energy is incident upon, upon a barrier of 5.5 electron volts. So this is our barrier height. What is the ratio of the densities of electrons in the reflected and transmitted beams? Look, the energy of the electrons is, is higher than the barrier. 2 is higher than 0.5. So Classical mechanics tells us that all electrons make it through. However, from quantum mechanics, we saw that that is not the case. H bar omega, which is the energy of the incident electrons, is equal to 2 electron volts, which is 2 times 1.6 times 10 to minus 9. That is 3.2 times 10 to minus 19 joule. Okay? So, that gives us uh, 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 here is omega, okay? That gives us k1. So our k1 is equal to 2m h bar omega. Omega is missing here, so we can substitute h bar omega is simply this energy here. So 2 times 9.1 times 10 to minus 31, that's the mass of the electron in kilograms. This is the energy, h bar omega, which is 3.2 times 10 to minus 19 joule, divided by reduced Planck's constant h bar, which is 1.05 times 10 to minus 34. This is the wave number K1 that we get in the left-hand side region. Okay, so I'm thinking of this very height here. This is my U0 here. And so I have a K1 here. And I have a K2 on this left-hand side. So my K1 is 7.27 times 10 to minus 9. Uh, times 10 to 9 meter minus 1. Similarly, H bar squared K2 squared 2M. That's for the right-hand side. Plus, this is U0, which is 0.5 times 1.6 times 10 to minus 19. 
and this is h bar squared k2 squared over 2m equal 3.2 10 to minus 19 this is the energy okay so we can use this equation to evaluate h k2 right uh, k2 and in this case we get a wave number k2 which is 6.3 times 10 to 9 meter minus 1 so we go back and substitute for the reflection coefficient r it's k1 minus k2 over k1 plus k2 squared and therefore if we substitute k1 and k2 we get 0 0.0051. So if we multiply by 100, what we are saying is that 0.5% of the incident particles are going to be reflected. And then for the transmitted, again, we take one, the total, total incident beam is one or 100% percentage, minus this reflected we get 0.9949 so that means 99.5 percent is transmitted okay so this goes through why because e is larger than u naught so what we are saying here most of the beam of electrons is transmitted because they have larger energy. So if we have million electrons, then we have 995,000 electrons transmitted and only uh, 500 electrons reflected. Okay? So the reflected electron density over the transmitted electron density is by dividing these two only 0.0513 of the transmitted so most of the electrons are transmitted so here even though you know only very little number of electrons are reflected but it's still it's a significant result because you don't expect this to happen in classical mechanics now we move on to another example this is an interesting example too and it has applications in electronics too and what let me describe the example here to you what I'm thinking here is think of a box and again it's in one dimension it's along the x-axis now this box it starts from x equals 0 and finishes at x equals L so the thickness or the width of this box is L. Now, L is very small. Normally in quantum mechanics, we're talking about very small length and very small distances. So this is a very small length, maybe nanometers, 10 to minus 9 of a meter. Inside this box or inside this region, the potential is zero no potential no forces acting on any electrons or particles here outside this region the potential is infinity very very large potential meaning that there are so big forces acting outside this width and these forces are so large so huge that the particle cannot leave the box so the particle is confined confined is a very important word the particle is confined to this box this gives a very important gives rise to a very important notion in quantum mechanics and that is what we call confinement that is when you have a particle in this case maybe an electron inside the region 
and is confined to this region, cannot move out of this region. Why? Because there are so much large forces outside this region that the particle cannot move. So it's confinement. The particle is arrested inside this region of width L. The particle is not able to leave this region. <coughs> now, what we could do again, we could use quantum mechanics. And we could use Schrodinger equation for this region. And remember, Schrodinger equation is h bar squared over 2m, okay, delta squared psi by delta x squared plus e minus u psi, right? That's the time independent part or the position dependent part. We said we never care about the time dependent part because it has only one solution and it doesn't depend on you. So that solution will always know. Now we can apply this Schrodinger equation to this region so our u would be equal to zero. Okay? So let's see what happens. So this is my Schrodinger because u is equal to zero, right? So I don't have u. So it becomes e times psi directly. And because I'm only talking about one dimension, x dimension, then this partial differential equation becomes a total differential equation. So this is my Schrodinger equation where inside the region of width L, where the potential is zero. Now, you probably saw this equation before. It's a very simple differential equation. And now, to try to solve this equation, or the solution of this equation, is very straightforward. I can try this function at psi, which is a sine function, and I include two constants, A, which is the amplitude, and this constant, phi, which I call phase angle. Why two constants? Because it's a second order differential equation, right? So, A and phi are constants. Look, this phi is a constant, right? So, what I can do is, okay, if this is a solution, then I'm going to substitute it back here and see what I get. So when I substitute it back, d squared of psi by dx squared, you get minus k squared, and you actually get psi again. So this here gives you this, and e of psi, it there. So when you substitute, you get k equals 2me, where e is the energy of the particle. Always, right? This e is the energy of the particle, where inside the region where we have a zero potential. So k, this wave number, is equal to 2me over h bar squared. That's the condition for this solution here. Okay, now the boundary conditions indicate that the particle is confined to the region 0 less than x less than L. Now, let me apply the boundary conditions. Here it is said, but let me apply them. Okay, so this is my psi at x equals 0, which is this point here, which is just outside the region or the well. If I shouldn't have the electron or the particle here, my wave function should be 0, because the wave function gives the, the probability of finding the particle. 
So I'm going to substitute x equals 0 here and set it equal to 0. So x for x equals 0 is going to be equal to a sine phi or phi. If you set this equal to 0, what does this imply? Either a is equal to 0, but if a is equal to 0, the whole solution, if psi, is equal to 0, is what we call the trivial solution. So, I'm not going to take this. The other condition is sine phi equals 0, or in that case, phi equals 0. So, applying the condition at this point here implies that phi is equal to 0. Phi here is a constant. Remember, this is not phi of t, a function of t, which comes in the wave function. This is a constant that I chose to call phi. Now I apply the second boundary condition. Let me clean it up here. The second boundary condition, actually, is at this point here. Point x equals l. So, at this point, again, if psi at x equals l, since the particle is confined, should be equal to 0. I should not find the particle out here. Okay? So, let me go back to the wave function and put x equals l and require that this is equal to 0. So my psi would be a sine kl. Remember, I have already established that phi is equal to 0, so phi doesn't exist. Okay? So a sine kl should be equal to 0 for it not to be able to get out of the region L at x equals L. Now, either A is equal to 0, and if A is equal to 0, then the whole function of psi is equal to 0, and therefore I'm going to reject this. The other thing is sine KL equals 0. So, if sine KL is equal to 0, then that means the angle KL should be pi, should be 0, or pi, or 2 pi, or 3 pi, or 4 pi, etc. So, KL should be equal to N times pi, where N or K should be equal to N pi over L, where N is equal to plus 1 or minus 1 integer. Okay, plus 2 or minus 2, etc. So, that's the condition. The wave number could be an integer, must be an integer times pi over L. Okay? So, that's the condition for the wave function to be equal to 0 outside that region at L equals L. So, the value n equals 0 is excluded because it makes it psi equal to 0. Again, we don't want the trivial solution. So, I only take the integer values, plus or minus 1, 2, etc. So, I also discard the negative values because if psi doesn't make any sense unless I multiply it by its complex conjugate. And the sine is an odd function. And when I apply, multiply it by its complex 
conjugate, which would be again an odd function, minus minus will be plus. So, I can only satisfy myself with the positive n. Okay? So, there is no probability of finding the particle outside this region, but this is an, a very, very important result. K, the wave number, takes a certain set of values. I want to remind you of one thing, though. 